Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. This is Tara at Omnitrax, and we have a lot of great information to cover now that the final ELD rule has officially been released. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to review. You have joined in a muted conference mode, so please use the chat box to your right to communicate with us. You can also type your questions for Tom in that box, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. We are recording today's session, so we will be emailing you with that recording shortly. And one last housekeeping note is if you have any um, technical issues, you can dial star zero for assistance with the operator. I'd now like to introduce you to your presenter. Tom Cuthbertson is VP of Regulatory Compliance at Omnitrax, and he has been in the industry for over 25 years as both a carrier and a supplier. Tom has reviewed the, EL, the final ELD rule and will be summarizing key points. So Tom, let's get started. Great, thanks, Tara. I hope everybody's having great holidays. Um, so what I'm gonna do is go over the final ELD mandate timeline as, as the regulation uh, said on a published date of 12-16. Uh, changes in the final rule, we're gonna cover who's, who needs to comply, they've changed some rules there. Enforcement transfer requirements, some display requirements, and then I'm gonna go over what's really not changed that we've been uh, communicating to, since the SNPRM has been out. Uh, and those are things like driver control of record of duty status, security and certification requirements, and then I wanna talk a little bit about a review on operational considerations for our, the unassigned vehicle moves in the beginning of drive, and these are some things we covered but I wanted to fortify some operational considerations people may need to, to uh, consider. And we put these glossaries together and people found value in them, but these are terms and acronyms that I'll probably uh, fall prey to using. Uh, and some of them are FIPS, so that's a security system and then some of these other uh, glossary items people are aware of by now. Um, there's a PKI as a public key. Uh, we're past OMB and OST because the final regulation's out, but there's some terms that we may hit in this. Uh, so if people have been on these webinars before, have seen uh, a more complex timeline that I've, I've illustrated before, and now that the final rule's out, uh, a little bit simpler to understand. So uh, as of December 16th, the final rule was published. January 16th is what we call the effective date, uh, but the compliance date is based off the published date in the Federal Register. So the compliance date would be December 16th in 2017, and then they also maintain the grandfather clause, as we call it, to, for anybody that installs an AOBRD before the 2016 compliance date, will be able to use those devices in their native uh, form in an AOBRD regulation form through December 2019. That's the last date that an AOBRD can be used that without being compliant. So two key things that were in the Federal Registry were, and, and on a previous webinars and the regulation process said that the prohib prohibition of coercion rule had to be issued prior to the ELD mandate, and it was, in fact, released on November 30th. Uh, different than in the NPRN that came out that had $11,000 potential fine should a carrier, dispatcher, broker, or shipper or consignee be found coercing a driver to falsify the logs, the penalty is now $16,000. Uh, the ELD mandate final date, as I said, was the 16th of December. Uh, we put this section together, and it's really a busy slide, but it's just for illustration that these are the sections that we would be covering for the ELD scope, motor carrier responsibility, driver ELD requirements, enforcement requirements, and driver access to information. Now, Who's going to be required to do these? So it still is any driver that is required to keep records of duty status, which I believe estimates that FMCSA put out in industry was about 3.1 million. Now, in the final rule, they came out with some exceptions. 
So every webinar we've had, I've been asked, what are they gonna do with mechanical engine vehicles? Well, what they, the way they addressed that was that if the vehicle manufacturing date is prior to 2000, that it would not be required to put an ELD in. Whoever's driving those vehicles are not alleviated from keeping a record of duty status on paper if they had to prior to this. Uh, so that would really is the answer for the mechanical engines. They also illustrate that the, the VIN number, since it needs to be captured, the last several digits of the VIN number indicate what year of manufacture the vehicle was. So if in a drive away or tow away where the product is vehicle is part of the shipment, they, they would not have to keep record or ELDs in those vehicles. So, so that's kind of uh, the location where somebody's going to a dealer and bringing back five tractors and they're stacked up on the fifth wheel. That's drive away or tow away type activity. So the other one is that if you're using rods less than eight days in a 30 day period, you would not be required to have an ELD. So that takes into consideration shoulder operations that currently are not subject to an ELD, but if they are using short haul and they break it, break short haul rules and have to go to paper or, or record of duty status rather, more than eight days in 30, then most likely they'll have to have an ELD. Uh, there was a lot of comments in the final rule about rental equipment and they did not address any exemptions there so rental equipment, I mean, if it's a short term, is going to be required to use, whoever drives it's gonna be required to use an ELD if they're required to keep record of duty status. So the spray requirements in the final rule, they increase. So as, it's, as it was in the SNPRM, there was, we were gonna capture the VIN number, we were gonna capture driver CDL and things like that. But in their illustrations and requirements in the final rule, these fields will now be required to be on the display for all the main header information that, that would be there. And it's beyond this, but it's DOT number, carrier name and address, but also the vehicle uh, number, the beginning ending odometer, the driver CDL and the state it was issued in, and exempt status, and that's where you're gonna to have to understand if somebody's required to keep records of duty status through an ELD or not. There's data diagnostic indicators and ELD man functions. We've used terms like sensor failures for ELD malfunctions, but we have to put indicators on the header that something occurred or there were zero or there was something. If there's unidentified driver records that have not been reconciled, we're supposed to identify that. Uh, and there's quite a bit of, of body log detail, meaning instead of just seeing duty statuses in the log detail anymore, we'll also see driver log in, driver log out, power up and power down in the vehicle, and any events that happen that we're required to record while the vehicle's in, you know, being used as an ELD. So the, the thing is that display is still valid for roadside inspection if it can be viewed without enforcement entering the vehicle. So they, they were very specific on that. Now the display requirement grid graph, in the SNPRM they talked about the potential of a fifth line that yard moves and um, personal conveyance would be recorded on a fifth line. That's not how it came out, uh, which is not a problem but uh, the yard move would be recorded as an on-duty line with either some either dotted line or some kind of color. And I've just made some uh, rough illustrations up here of a grid graph that would be displayed. And then the yard move might be a colored red and we might do a mustard color or something like that to show that personal conveyance was used on a drive line, but it was in fact personal conveyance. It, now, people have asked this, they're not changing any requirements for personal conveyance. They're just changing how it would be illustrated. The other thing that uh, they did, uh, many of the suppliers, including us, made comments on things that we felt would not be effective or cost more money to implement. Uh, this is what came out in the final rule. So there's two distinct methods now 
instead of the way that they've had it before. First method is a telematics transfer method, and that's defined as web services and email SM, SMTP uh, methodology, and that's the same as was in the original SMPRM, but they've made it a category. Second one is a peer-to-peer -peer transfer method, and this is Bluetooth web services where you build a local network between Bluetooth devices of enforcement and a vehicle. And also within that peer-to-peer -peer transfer category, which is the same as the original proposed rule, is USB 2.0. Now, the way, the way it's illustrated is the supplier, whichever methodology they pick, they must do both methods. So if we pick telematic transfer method, we must have, be able to do web services and email. This does not alleviate the security requirement, and I'll talk about that a little later. Now, enforcement, you know, when we look at the little smaller box there, enforcement, whatever jurisdiction it is, whether it's Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Colorado, California, they will have to pick one from each category so that whatever vehicle or supplier they, truck they pull up to with a device in it, they will have to pick one telematics method and one peer-to-peer -peer transfer method so that whatever device, they have a way to get the information off the vehicle. So the filing rule did not use QR codes and it did not use transfer jet. They found that the comments justified not using those methods. What's really the same in the final rule that, that we've talked about before? Yard moves are still there, so it's not drive, it's only on duty. And when you're not in a yard move and you begin to drive, drive will start at up to five miles per hour. And, and that situation, right, there's no distance and there's no, no, no time. It's just when you hit five miles per hour, you will be in drive. The only on-duty status that they had, final on-duty status they talked about was stop for five minutes where we would have driver interaction. And they really did this for traffic considerations. So if somebody stops for five minutes and we ask, we would, we were required to ask a question, do you want to remain in drive or do you want to go to on duty? You're supposed to display that question for a minute. And since the vehicle's not in motion, the driver is able to respond to it. So at that point, they can decide to remain in drive or they can, they can put it into, leave it, go to an on-duty status, and uh, as, as traffic goes along, if they don't exceed five miles per hour, it may not go back into a drive. That's, that's a circumstance at roadside. The proposed item of interoperability, they said, it's not really there, it's not a requirement. They want us to create the file so that the driver has one of those options to taking the logs with them for the eight days and create this file, but we do not have to provide the ability to take a file from somebody else and upload it into the LD. Uh, we talk, I'll talk more about the driver control. They created the transfer file or roadside, you know, an EROD's file, that's the same. Uh, mobile devices are acceptable with, as long as we're integrated to the engine. and our, We have both products in, in our product suite. And their driver requirements to get copies of rods for eight days is there. And we can facilitate a way for a driver to go up and get logs for six months should they desire, as long as they're not required to go to the carrier to request these. So in, in our products, we have uh, driver portals on both product lines, XRS and MCP product lines, and you know, creating a PDF file or an image of PDF files is, is taking a fixed copy of the logs with. Uh, these are the same. All drivers can edit their logs and create annotations on the entries and edits. Uh, cannot reduce drive time, but can extend drive time. Driver must approve all edits from the support systems before they're applied. So if somebody in the back office sends a, a, an edit down to the driver, it's still the way it was in the SMPRM. The driver has to accept it or reject it and annotate. 
Required drivers have direct access. We've covered that. Ensure that a driver reviews all logs before they are applied, meaning he's got to sign off that his logs are acceptable the way they are. Personal conveyance still will not be required to get engine information. And GPS recording while in personal conveyance can't be more any more accurate than a 10-mile radius. Driver still has to have the ability to mute the device and be able to turn the speakers down or off. And driver still is to be presented with unassigned vehicle moves and, and reconcile them or, or deny them with some comments. Certification process the same. Uh, we will not see the documents, the final documents on certification. I believe it said 60 days in the final rule. But we'll, don't, we'll still have to supply documents. We'll have to get a registration number and, and be able to display it and capture it for the EROD's file and, and for roadside enforcement to see that we're registered technically accurately with FMCSA. Um, specific form descriptions of the product have to be there. And like I said, this should be out within about 60 days for us to review. Security transfer, they really didn't change any of the security requirements. Um, they're still using this standards like AES 256. So, so if enforcement picks a USB or a supplier picks a USB, that the thumb drive that would be used to transfer would be compatible to the security structure. Uh, web services and email must adhere to NIST and PIPS publication 197. And in general, the, the security items are identified in NIST SP8032. Uh, that's a long document, but there's specific items in there that are called out for within the ELD mandate. Some operational considerations we've covered before, but I wanted to hit these again. And with this driver reconciling unassigned moves, you know, make sure we understand what the operational potential causes are. So a driver did forget to log in for whatever reason. And typically that's in the learning curve time. So they're driving, they're driving down without a login, and now we get an unassigned vehicle move. Mechanic does a road test, doesn't log in. He takes 15 miles to do a road test and comes back. Now we have an unassigned vehicle. Maybe somebody moves the, the, the relocates the tractor to another yard, or depending on how the, the maintenance structure is, maybe he takes the vehicle into a dealer somewhere for warranty and doesn't log into the device. Doesn't matter what it's still an unassigned vehicle move to be recorded. So there's other operational considerations here. You know, and if the driver doesn't log out, and you, maybe you have a mechanic just jumps in the cab and does a road test. Now you have an extra leg there that really doesn't belong to that driver for, for drive time. Um, the same thing happened in the reverse with the mechanic who log, does log in because you give him a login, and, and he doesn't log out, and the driver jumps in the vehicle. So they talk about things where you have to, you know, look at drivers, identify them, and you have to create a driver profile and indicate that it's a driver. So it doesn't prevent anybody from having mechanics with a login or, or other logins for those people so that you can take the unassigned vehicle move and not have the driver responsible for reconciling all these. Back office can still do some reconciliation because if a driver declines it, that's where you have to take care of that. You know, so really when you're implementing these things or even now, you know, let's make sure people log off when, they, when they're completing their function, completing their route for that day or completing the run for the evening so that people don't come in and, and log in over the top of them or give them the opportunity to have more unassigned vehicle moves because they will have to be reconciled. Um, just covering this again, you know, this, is a, this yard move is a manual event. There's no trigger mechanism to say when yard move ends, you know, there were questions and suggestions for this, but those, those did not happen. So the way it is right now, in the final rule, the yard move is responsibility of a manual event for the driver to put himself into and take them out of. So it doesn't matter. That's how it is right now for how it would be structured. Um, so we're really not recording time and distance. 
you know, we're recording on duty time. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So in the background, though, we'll be recording some motion, but it's not going to show up on a drive line. It's just, it's just a recording requirement. So with that, I just would like to remind us that we have a, and we'll keep posting more detail and information on the, on the website that we've set up on ELD facts. This is really for information for the ELD mandate. Uh, so we'll be updating things from, you know, what was an SNPRM to this is the actual final rule. And there'll still be the white papers, videos, and, and more uh, opportunities there. So with that, I think I'd like to turn it back over to Tara. All right, thank you so much, Tom. So just really briefly, I wanted to let everyone know that we are having a user conference starting January 31st. And uh, there's a lot of great sessions that cover a lot of the things that Tom has gone over today. Tom is leading several sessions in our compliance and safety track. So a selected um, bunch here is regulatory FAQ, where you can come and bring your questions and have them answered live. The myth of the road menace, regulatory update, best practice in responding to driver citation. We have a lot of great speakers from ATA, FMCSA. Our keynote is former Texas Governor Rick Perry. We've got dozens of breakout sessions and a lot of really great networking opportunities. And it's also the first place you can learn about some of our products that have not yet been announced. So the URL is right here. We encourage you to check it out. And uh, now I want to move on to questions. So right now we will take any of your questions that we have time for. So please type those in the chat or Q&A box. And uh, I'm just going to jump right in, Tom. So yeah. I see one here. Um, All right. The yep. Slip seat driving circumstances. So you have multiple drivers uh, in the same vehicle. There's no issues with that. Um, we, have, we handle slip seating right now with the product because once you log in, it'll synchronize with the, the log from whatever other vehicle you were in and present the logs back down to the truck at the time the driver logs in. So we do handle that. Great, thank you. Um, now this question is, how is the eight days and 30 number calculated for a company that does both short haul and regular operations? Oh, that's a, that's a tricky one. So, you know, the carrier is responsible to, to designate what rule set that the driver's running. Um, well, so if you're running short haul, you typically run short haul for the period of time that that, that week, that 60 hour period or that 70 hour period. And if you're running uh, regular rods uh, rule set, you're running it for a week. So we'll, we'll make modifications that if you declare that you're running short haul, that we'll see how many times over a 30-day period on account if you had to go to rot record of duty status. Remember under short haul that if you, you're on the position of taking a 16-hour big day or a 16-hour exemption day, that requires to be on record of duty status. Now, you can only do it once a week, so that only accounts for four out of, out of 30. Uh, it won't put you out of the realm of being able to do short haul, but if you break a radius of 100 miles more than once a week, uh, those will start to add up and could put in a position that we'll have to keep counts on how many times when you declare short haul that you broke that rule set for that period of time. All right, thank you, Tom. Now, um, for the drivers who use their trucks for personal use, um, they will be able to do this without it showing as on duty? Well, it, yeah, it, it, you have to be off duty to do personal conveyance. The, the, the way the regulation reads now, again, this part has nothing to do necessarily with an ELD. It just, we just have responsibilities on how we display it. So they're not changing the rule that said you have to be unladen, meaning you're not under a load or you don't, you're not running a manifest. So that's unladen, right? Doesn't say you have to be bobtailed. It just says you're unladen, right? And then you, have to be off duty. So when you're in motion, they start, you know, I've not used the term so much before, but they introduce on duty not or off duty driving. So that's personal conveyance. So on a drive line, 
it would it would be illustrated in the grid graph that the way they put it in the final rule that we would put a different color on the drive line to indicate that's personal conveyance. And in the detail of the log, we would indicate when they went on personal conveyance as a requirement and when they went off personal conveyance as a requirement. Thank you, Tom. Now this person had a question about uh, slide 13 and just said, can you please explain the harassment control that you mentioned on this slide? On slide 13, let me go back to that. More driver control. Right, what I mean by that is, I think the way they addressed harassment, you know, and you, we can interpret this and people can interpret it any way they'd like, but the, the issue on harassment was that, you know, people were changing things on the driver and they didn't know what they were, was happening to their logs. And the way they've illustrated it is, or not illustrated, the way they defined it and it's a requirement is that the, this slide here says they put all the, the control of the record of duty status in the hands of the driver. So we're not allowed, if somebody makes an edit at the back office, it can't just show up and the driver has to accept it. The driver has the ability to decline an edit from the back office. The driver has the ability now under regulation to edit the logs to have everything correct the way they know it should be. So I think that's the way I'm saying I think they addressed it. You know, the fact that personal conveyance, you're not going to record you know, your one mile radius of where the truck is as the vehicle's moving, it's a 10 mile radius. We're not recording all the information. Um, the fact that nobody can take an unassigned driver leg, right, and, and apply it to a log without the driver knowing it's there, and they have the right to decline it. So I, I think by giving a, a, a big control to the driver, I think they're addressing those, that situation you know, and I've, I heard on listening sessions I attended, you know, one thing that really isn't, has anything to do with an ELD, but if people send a dispatch down to a driver while he's in a sleep or birth, they don't want to be disturbed, so turn off the speakers, be able to mute the speakers, and don't worry about addressing the message until they get their valid rest. Okay, thank you. Um, what will the requirement be for drivers who punch a time clock, run a 100-mile radius of terminal? Well, that's a short-haul requirement. So, uh, you know, when you look at the short-haul requirements, you know, and I'll just review them real quick. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be a 100-mile radius for CDL drivers. You're supposed to be able to, you're supposed to come and go from the same location that day. You have to be able, you have, you can't do more than a 12 hour on duty time. It doesn't alleviate the 11 hour drive time. You still can't drive more than 11 hours. Not that that would necessarily happen in short haul. And, and the fact is that you have to be able to keep a time clock to justify that you were only on duty for 12 hours because the short haul requirement says you do not have to keep record of duty status if you comply to all those other requirements. Okay, thank you. Do you think down the line they will force even short haul companies to use ELDs just to monitor driver hours even if they don't need a log? I, I, I don't know that. Um, we've implemented it to give the flexibility. Uh, we did an XRS, we're gonna be doing it in the MCP product. But we did it so that there's the flexibility in being able to switch over to federal rules should you break the rule set. I, because they came out with saying that you only, if, if you don't keep record of duty status more than eight days in a 30-day period, everything's okay. You don't have to have an ELD. I think because they came out with that in the final rule that it's not necessarily a thought process right now to try and uh, put a burden of additional activity or cost on somebody that really does, isn't required during, based on regulation language. Thank you. Now, um, this person is asking if you could revisit the timeline. I think the main question here is just the meaning of the 2019 date and a quick summary of dates that anyone needs to know. Sure. 
the timeline that I put together um, just has the, you know, there's only, there's only three key dates in the timeline. One, when did they actually publish the regulation, which was the, the 16th, and then the compliance date. So if you did nothing, if you don't do anything, you're going to have to be compliant uh, by December 2017 with some device in your, your vehicle that, ha that is compliant to the ELD mandate. If you've put an AOBRD, the current rule, into your vehicles any time before that date, then what they look at this as, we'll give you two more years to maintain the investment without making any changes up until December 2019. So say I spent, you know, $200 on a device or $300, whatever it happens to be, and I put it in um, January or February, and I made that investment. So I can use that device without getting a software upgrade or changing it out for whatever reason all the way through December 2019. If Thank I do nothing, that. which I, I don't suggest to wait until, you know, 60 or 90 days before uh, you know, December 2017, because there'll be a lot of items there, a lot of people trying to get resources. So I, I hope that explained the timeline. Yes, yeah, uh, thank you for that. Thanks for clarifying. Um, this question is, who is responsible for recording the unassigned moves? Well, it, there's two responsibilities. One is give the driver the opportunity Maybe they were they were in a rush and they just forgot to log in, right? It's not a penalty, right? But they need to log in and reconcile their logs. That's why they're giving the driver the ability to edit. So that unassigned movement could have been the driver's responsibility, and then he can put it in as a drive line and edit it appropriately and make a comment. So now he's you know everybody's doing the right thing. If if the unassigned vehicle move was was done by the carrier or the driver says, hey, you just pushed an unassigned vehicle move at me and it really wasn't mine, it belonged to a mechanic, right? Then the carrier's responsibility for getting those unassigned vehicle moves reconciled. So there's two people here that are responsible. One is give it to the driver to let him look at it. It might just as well be his. Or if it's not his and they decline it, then the carrier is responsible for saying where did, it, where, where did it come from and who did it. Thank you. Um, will carriers with less than five units be required to apply this device to their vehicles? If, the, if those carriers are required to keep record of duty status now and it doesn't meet any of our other criteria for drive away or that the, the, it's an older truck prior to 2000, and they're required to keep records of duty status now, whether it's five trucks or, or one truck. You, it, it, the way the regulation is laid out, that's who's required to do it. Anybody required to keep record of duty status that don't fit one of the other three exemptions. Thank you. Now, Tom, when does Omnitrex believe their products will meet the final mandate? Can you give people any sort of idea about that? I think it'd be premature for me to say it right now. We spent time um, through the summer months looking at the SNPRM to start to estimate some things, and there are changes in the final rule um, that we need to examine, and we, and we started as soon as it was published. So we're still in that process right now. I think I, I would be, be inappropriate for me to say, oh, it'll be six months or it'll be some other number of months. Okay, thank you for addressing that. Uh, this question is, if I arrive at a truck stop and start looking for a parking spot, is that a yard move or on-duty driving? Funny, I had that question earlier today. Um, it, it's going to be a situation where it's not defined in there of what a yard move consists of. But a yard move definition is a manual event. It's not a duty status, it's a manual event that the driver is allowed to use. So I don't see anything that says, you know, if, if you're in a yard, not on a road, that it couldn't be used. Uh, but I would suspect that there'll be some detailed guidance coming out of that in the next six months. 
but right now it doesn't say that that can't be done. It doesn't define what a yard is. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just combing through here. Um, will the drivers still need to have a paper log in the truck with them in case the e-log unit malfunctions? And they'll still need to account for their previous seven days on paper, correct? Yes. So let, let's review really what's required. So, you know, I'm not going to get into your credentials that your drivers have to have, like medical cards, but when you have an electronic logging device, they didn't change those rules. You're still required to have a blank log book. We will still be required to supply and your drivers will have to maintain uh, the enforcement instruction card, know how to use the device and demonstrate that they can use it. Those things have not changed. Thanks, Tom. Um, my company already has this capability. How will I know if or when mine is ELD compliant? Well, you know, it, it, our customers will get formal notification, I'm sure anybody else would, but we'll get formal notification because we have to apply and get our certification number off FMCSA, and it has to be inserted in the ELD so that the file that we need to create for enforcement at roadside has to have that number available, and we have to be able to display the number in the detailed log headers that's a requirement in the current regulation. So that's how you know that you will be in a, in a ELD mandate device compliant. All right, thank you. Would unassigned moves be when dispatched for a DOT physical, for example? That's an on-duty requirement. Um, you're, you know, at that point, you know, if you look in the detail under hours of service, whether you're going for a physical, you're on duty, if it's a requirement of a driver, uh, driver safety meetings are still on duty, they still have to be recorded as an on-duty activity. All right, thank you. Um, let me just find another question. How does it work when using a rental car to take over for another driver in a different state? Well, that's that's just that's a standard hours of service question. That you're if you're moving to to a load and you're you're required to do that. That's that's really an on duty requirement, but not driving. All right, thank you. What will be the biggest effect, if any at all, of the ELD mandate on brokerages? I I don't. Um, I don't know that there's any specific direct effect on brokerages other than being aware of prohibition of coercion. Uh, in, the, in the mandate itself, because brokers are licensed to dispatch loads like 3PLs type of thing, um, so if you're a broker, I mean, the only caution I would put out is a discussion to make sure that you're not putting a load out to a driver and trying to force them to take a load that they don't have hours for. Okay, thank you. And this person just wants clarification on, they're saying 2000 and older trucks or 1999 are exempt from ELD? That's what the regulations, the final one came out that said if the vehicle, because they didn't, they, they asked for, um, my thing just went away. Um, the, what they asked for was um, mechanical engine, and they asked for comments on mechanical engines. And many of us as suppliers gave them comments on the mechanical engines and wanted to make sure that uh, there was an answer for that. But all the answers to put a box or functional equipment to get miles and things like that would be an increased cost, and I don't think anybody wanted to go there and it required a lot of calibration uh, for the system. So they came out with vehicles prior to 2000 uh, would not be required to have an ELD, but still be required to keep record of duty status, if it was so case for that driver. Thank you. 
Um, now this question is, does the comment about different color for personal conveyance suggest a black and white printer cannot be used as a display? Well, no, because, because you could, you know, they said you could do dotted lines or dashed lines or some kind of indicator on a drive line to say it's personal conveyance. Um, I just think, you know, a, a method would be to, to be able to, um, excuse me, um, use your colors if, if you have a, a color display, it makes it much easier to use. And, and it doesn't alleviate that you don't you, you you're not required you don't have to print it's just an option to print. Thank you. Um, now, Tom, what guidance could you give to a carrier that wants to require all drivers to have an ELD that has trucks prior to 2000 that are able to accommodate the ELD? Well, I, I guess I, I guess there there's nothing that says that you can't use them. Um, I mean, uh, there's somebody, you know, on this conference I saw is, is very well tuned in the industry. So I'll just try and say that approximately ECM showed up on a regular basis somewhere around 1996. I think it was J1587 was the right standard. And so we, we hooked into ECMs back then without these mechanical devices to measure miles. So it doesn't say that you, if you have trucks that, that have an ECM that you can't put an ELD in and be functional because the J1587, J1708 was used well past 2000 on vehicles and it was still being put out in, in new man, newly manufactured vehicles then. So you can use one on an ELD if it's prior, it's just that they're, all, they're allowing an exemption. So that shouldn't, that won't be an issue if you care to put an ELD in. All right, thank you for that tip. Um, how will the ELD mandate be enforced? If a carrier is pulled over, how much data can an enforcement officer look through to determine if a violation of HOS has occurred? Well, the requirement is still only, only uh, eight days, right? That, that's what's on them, but that hasn't changed. Okay, how do drivers show on-duty time for pre-trip, fueling, getting paperwork, et cetera, prior to beginning their work days? It's standard on-duty status. I mean, it's, it's no different than what you would do now on an AOBRD. If you're, if you're doing activities and you're in an on-duty status, you just put yourself into on-duty. You log into your device and, and set the on-duty. All right, thank you, Tom. We have time for a couple more questions. So this one is, under the harassment rules, are you prohibited from maintaining positions within 10 miles or just not required to maintain those positions? No, it, it, here's what it is. It, 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 the, the ELD is required to maintain GPS once an hour while the vehicle's in motion, and you're required to have GPS at every duty status change, and every event, and every login, and every logout. So you're required to capture GPS to show the locations, and they talk about you need to show miles and direction, like 12 miles north, northeast of Scranton, or 14 miles south, southwest of Atlanta. So those are requirements. This, this 10 mile radius of only capturing GPS at that accuracy is only when the driver goes into personal conveyance. And when they're in personal conveyance, any location on movement is not supposed to be better than a 10 mile radius. Thank you. Uh, what does it take to be a base of operations and can you do short haul to move between base of operations? Well, you know, short haul, when you talk about base of operations, you know, and, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the way the term's being used, but base of operation says that if I run in and out of my facility, meaning home, and I'm back and forth to that all the time, and I don't go anywhere else, I just run in the morning out of there and come back the same night, that's where short haul could apply. Wherever you are, right, you have to go and come from the same location 
to be able to be short, to use short haul. Now, when you get into the 16 hour big day exemption, don't forget that that's a short haul exemption, but to use a 16 hour, 16 hour exemption day, you have to have gone and come from the same location for the five previous duties, tour duty. So you'd have to come and go from the same base of operations five times before you could use that, that short haul exemption to 16 hour. Thank you, Tom. We have time for one more question, which is just, are there any fleet size exemptions? I have not seen any. Well, that was easy. <laughs> okay, let's ask one more question. Uh, did we ask one about a rental car? How does it work when using a rental car to take yeah, over? Yeah, I asked that one, and I said you're, it's an on-duty. You're not you're not driving a, a CMV, but you still have to account for on-duty time. Okay. What about when they refuse to allow them to sleep on their property? Is that a question? That's going to be a discussion where, um, and that one's been around for some time, and I've had that question many times. Um, the hours are the hours, right? I, I can't address it any other way. I think that there's circumstances that will arise, and, and I know they hit drivers now with, they only have, they, they got a delay at the shipper, they only have a half hour left, and they need, they need 45 minutes to get where they need to go. Um, so th that has not been specifically addressed in the LD mandate. All right. Well, thank you, Tom. And uh, we do need to wrap things up now. So thank you to all of our participants today. We are flooded with excellent questions. We just absolutely cannot get to all of them, but we will be reviewing them and following up as necessary. So um, yeah. also be on the lookout for the recording that we'll be sending in the next few days. And be sure to check out eldfacts.com. And one other thing, Tara, many yep. of the questions that we have here if we can't get to answer them, they'll be incorporated in one of the Outlook presentations at kind of an FAQ thing that we're going to have on the products. That's great, yep. As I mentioned at our, our user conference, which you can check out at omnitracks.com forward slash Outlook, um, there's a lot of sessions by Tom. You can check the schedule and the FAQ one that he mentioned is a really great one because you can come up with all the questions you want and and bring those, and, and this will be the event to, to get those questions answered live by a variety of experts in the industry. So we do hope to see you at our user conference in January. Please check it out, and uh, have a great day, everybody. Thank you.